Hello, and welcome to AIM International's preparatory tutorials for the Information Certification Exam. I'm Steve Weissman, Principal Consultant at Holly Group and a certified AIM training instructor in the realm of content, process, and information management. I'll be your guide as we review the exam's major domains of expertise, and I'll tell you all you need to know to earn that passing grade. Today's subject is records management, a key part of this special certification which AIM created to support you as you solve your organization's existing information related problems and plan for its future. For 60 years, AIM has been the leading nonprofit association helping users understand how to best manage documents, content, records, and business processes. This module is part of the Secure and Preserve Knowledge Domain, one of six within the certification program. In it, we'll describe the concept of records retention and we'll discuss the elements of the records management life cycle. All records have a life cycle that subjects them to a number of different activities from the time they're declared until the time they're disposed of. This time may be as short as a few hours, as is the case with some transient records, or as long as forever, as is the case with records of enduring historical value. Knowing how long something must be kept is fundamental to developing a records retention schedule. A control document, like the one shown here, that exists for all records irrespective of the format in which they're maintained or the media upon which they're stored. Records can be, and generally are, used to demonstrate compliance with applicable laws and regulations to law enforcement agencies, government regulators, and other parties seeking confirmation of compliance. For example, prospective investors or other business partners, or parties seeking to bring legal action against the company, and so forth. Such compliance is the major rationale for records retention since failure to establish a formal program may lead to inappropriate destruction or retention of records that may cause significant legal and business issues later on. Cost savings and litigation prevention also are at work here, since the proper management of records can trim storage requirements and save time when the need arises to review information included in documents created in the distant past. Time can also be saved by disposing of records that no longer need to be retained since such documents would no longer be relevant for discovery purposes in a litigation context. Further, valuable business information about customers and other business partners can be more quickly and easily shared if there are fewer places for employees to hunt for it. Note that multiple copies of records may exist, and these need to be addressed as well, generally by identifying the original or designating one version as the copy of record and then retaining the other copies for shorter periods. For the purpose of this discussion of the records life cycle, let's use as a foundation an itemization called Seven Elements of an Effective Records Management Program from THE Ohio State University. These elements are controlled and driven by policies and procedures, which differ from industry to industry and company to company. Ultimately, they should be rolled together into a written, adopted, implemented, and regularly updated manual of policies and procedures the existence of which encourages and promotes consistency in how records are handled. Let's take them one by one. The beginning of any good records management program starts by conducting a records inventory that's a complete and accurate listing of records, whether paper, microform, or electronically based, that indicates how and where the records are stored, the volume of storage, how the records are classified for future use and retrieval sensitivity of information and access, and what their retention period is, if known, or its legal, fiscal, and administrative value, if not. Once these factors are determined, and the record is classified and saved as such, it's said to be declared. Next, a records retention schedule is developed. Besides noting at minimum how long records must be retained and what their ultimate disposition is to be, a retention schedule may indicate a legal or regulatory citation that mandates a specific retention period, how long the record should be maintained in an active on-site file, how long they may need to be retained in inactive off-site storage, and whether they're vital records. Each record's life cycle is determined by analyzing three primary needs, legal, fiscal, and administrative. There are also three secondary needs, evidential, historical, and informational. The next step is to determine whether your existing filing and storage strategy is adequate for the task you're evaluating or whether you need to develop a new one. Questions to ask here include 
Where and how do you store your active records? Where and how do you store your inactive records? Do you have a records hold procedure in the event of litigation? What are the access procedures for sensitive records? What are your procedures for transferring records of enduring historical value to the archives? How are you storing your electronic records? What are the environmental conditions of your storage facilities? At some point in a record's life, it may be converted to a digital image, or to microfilm, or both, to enhance access, or reduce physical storage, or provide disaster recovery and preservation tools. So you may need to ask these questions in a couple of different contexts, including what records management applications may already exist and how they're approaching these questions. Determining which of your vital records is a critical part of this process. Vital records are those essential organizational records needed to meet operational responsibilities under emergency or disaster conditions. A good way to begin figuring out which of those are is to ask, which records would need to be recreated from backup copies if the originals are lost or rendered inaccessible in a disaster? In a private corporation, these typically are shorter-term records that have legal and fiscal implications and amount to 1 to 7 percent of an organization's records. In government agencies, these often are long-term records like birth certificates, titles and deeds, and other personal and realty data that must be preserved for historical purposes. Vital records should be identified as an integral part of a disaster recovery plan for business continuity. Disaster prevention safeguards are included in records management procedures and applications that can protect records by adding a unique identifier as metadata, safeguarding against unauthorized editing or deletion, and providing an audit trail of any authorized changes to record, metadata, or system settings. Properly executed disaster prevention policies and procedures can forestall or eliminate altogether the events that necessitate disaster recovery. Speaking of disaster recovery plans, these must-haves are written, approved, and implemented procedures for the prevention, mitigation, and recovery from records loss in an emergency or disaster. They should include at least the following components. Chain of command with contact information. A decision tree for appropriate actions. Listing of emergency management officials with contact information. Listing of records reclamation vendors. Listing of vendors of supplies, computer equipment, record storage, and so forth. List of supplies needed to help mitigate loss. Identification of an alternative operational site that's either a hot site with all the computing equipment and software needed to put yourself back in business, or a cold site to which you have to bring your backups and all your computing equipment Backup policy and procedures for electronic files, with backup preferably stored off-site at least five miles from an operating system, and system restoration procedures. Remember, the biggest threat to records is water, whether from flood, leaky pipe, or even the water involved with putting out a fire. Remember, too, to review and test your plan on a regular basis to make sure it's still appropriate to your needs. Oh, and not incidentally, Another major threat to records is the fact that hardware and software incompatibilities and media instabilities crop up all the time. These, among other things, can complicate the maintaining and restoring of electronic records over extended periods. The final stage of records management is disposition, and is when a record is either destroyed or permanently retained. These actions typically fall into one of two categories. Destruction, via disposal and trash or recycling, shredding, macerating, incinerating, pulping, and deleting or other electronic obliteration, or transfer to an archives for permanent preservation. Regularly disposing of records lightens the load of what you have to retain and manage, and often makes legal counsel and compliance executives happy as well, since there are fewer places for potential smoking guns to be found. This module has described the concept of records retention and discussed the elements of the records management life cycle. Next, you may wish to dig more deeply into the regulatory and judicial issues that affect these issues. The material you have just reviewed is part of a broader program of study that prepares you to take the information certification exam. This proctored test consists of 100 multiple choice questions and is delivered electronically by Prometric. You'll have two hours to complete it, and upon passing, you'll earn a professional certification that's valid for three years. For more information, please visit www.aim.org slash certification. Thank you.